if you'll turn in your Bibles to Psalm 103, that is our text for today. Last time, we studied Psalm 102. As you know, we've been going through selected psalms. I never really intended for it to be this way, where I'd get to Psalm 100 and then just want to do 101, 102, 103, and yes, I'm going to preach Psalm 104, but I think we're going to change the series after that. I'm not going to go all the way to 150, but last time we, we studied Psalm 102, And we saw an afflicted man who was faint and pouring out his complaint before the Lord. He was crying out to God for deliverance. Now today's psalm, Psalm 103, was written by King David. It appears to be the answer to those kind of prayers that that man was offering in his desperation, in his depression. And these answers are causing him to express praise and thanks. It's really a celebration of God's deliverance. So I wanted for us to uh, pause and and read the psalm together as just a way to boast about the Lord. I mean, we serve an awesome God, and so we're going to consider who he is and what he's done, and how appropriate is that. This is our worship to him today. Uh, This psalm is unique and beautiful in how it contains no requests. There's no request in it. It just simply glorifies Yahweh for who he is and what he's done. It teaches us about what the one true God is is like. He's a covenant-keeping God, and we can put all of our confident hope in him. And that might be a a correction for some of your thinking about God. I don't know, you know, people come from a wide variety of backgrounds. You never quite know who's in the room. But some people may have grown up thinking about God as some kind of over-demanding parent or teacher, you know, a cold master that, that demands perfection from you and is disappointed in you. Well, Psalm 103 is going to assure us that God understands our human weakness. He knows that we're frail. He knows that we're prone to wander. And while he is troubled by our sin, he never stops loving us. And so before we take a look, let's pause and, and ask the Spirit to teach us through his word. Heavenly Father, We ask for your Holy Spirit to illuminate your word this morning as we read the words of Scripture, the words preserved for us to encourage us in our walks. Lord, we we pray just that, that you would encourage us and bless us this morning as we bless you for who you are and all that you've done. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's read the beginning of the text. So Psalm 103, starting in verse 1. David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. So we see here in this first part that David starts this psalm with an expression of supreme gratitude. He's thanking God. Uh, This phrase, to bless the Lord, can simply also mean to to thank the Lord. It's it's attributing worth to him, saying that he has health-giving power. But it's a way to say, thank you, God. And and I think we all need to be frequently reminded to be grateful. So often we, we forget to give thanks where it's due. You know, whether it's to family members employers, employees, mailmen, garbage men, waiters. Think about all these people that we should be thanking and we unfortunately forget to thank. And unfortunately we do that with God many times too. We forget to thank God for all of the things that he's done. But we should be a people that bless and thank God. I was thinking about this and I was reminded of the book of Esther. I was thinking about that story and how there's the Persian king Xerxes He was suffering from insomnia. He he couldn't sleep. And so he had one of his servants read him the annals of the kingdom. You know, kind of like the business meeting minutes of the Persian kingdom. That sounds like an effective strategy to go to sleep, right? And uh, that was happening. But as they're reading him the Chronicles of the Empire, the king was reminded of a significant event that happened in his life. How this man named Mordecai saved his life from an assassination plot. You would have think he would, he would have remembered that. But as he hears, he goes, oh, yeah, Mordecai. And then he remembered, wait a second, I never rewarded him for his heroic deed 
and tipping me off that someone wanted to take my life. And so once he realized that, he quickly changed it. He immediately had the royal robes, the, the royal horse brought out, and he, he honored Mordecai. And, uh, you know, I think that's a great, great story to re- help us remember what it should be like when we remember everything that God has done for us. We should change course and thank and praise him. How can we not be grateful to our God? How can we not return him our praise? He saved our souls. And he's really the source of every blessing we experience, not just our eternal salvation, but, but every blessing. So he deserves all of our thanks and praise. As we look at this psalm, I want you to notice how often David uses the word all in the psalm. It's everywhere in this psalm. All that is within me. There's no half-hearted worship here. This is a worship of the whole being. That, that word soul in the original language is the word nefesh, which uh, usually refers to one's life itself or that immaterial part of you. That is where your emotions, thoughts, passions come from. To worship God, to thank God from the innermost being. And I think one effective way to stir up gratitude in our souls is to remember the works of our awesome God, all that he's done for us. And that's exactly what David does in this psalm. You know, we as believers, we've been given an amazing benefits package, if you will, from the Lord. So let's review some of these benefits along with David. First of all, we bless the Lord for all he has done. We bless the Lord for all he has done. And David starts out with this. He forgives all our sin. The Lord forgives all our sin. Now, once again, the word all here is so significant, so powerful. Think about that. Your life, every sinful thought, action, motive. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord and Savior, and all of that is forgiven. That almost sounds too good to be true. But that's why we call it good news, that God forgives the repentant soul from every single thought, word, or action that is contrary to him. Everything that is sinful in us can be forgiven. One theologian put it this way, if so much as the very smallest iniquity in thought, word, or act were left unforgiven, we should be just as badly off, just as far from God, just as unfit for heaven, just as exposed to hell, as though the whole weight of our sins were yet upon us. Let the reader ponder this deeply. But we're forgiven of every sin. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. First John 1, verse 8 and 9 says this, If we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once more, all. Christ bore our every sin when he died on the cross. And so God forgives our every sin. The debt is paid in full. And if that wasn't enough, there's more. (laughs) What else has God done for us? He also heals all our sickness. He heals all our sickness, David says. This is one of the, uh, the names of God, actually, Yahweh Rapha. That is the God who heals. God is the God who heals. You know, sickness is a part of living in a world under the curse of sin, but our God is the God who heals. He preserves us. He provides us with medicine for the body and grace for the soul. God is is able to prevent us from illness and cure us in body, but more importantly, he heals our soul's sin sickness. Sin is sickness for us, you know, whether it's the leprosy of lust, whether it's the, the lunacy of pride or the fever of anger. God transforms our hearts and he heals us of those sicknesses. Now, I want to be careful here. A lot of people have taken this verse, Psalm 103, I'm looking at verse 3 in particular, when it says that he heals all your diseases. There's some who have singled this verse out of context and pretty much based their entire ministry on it. Uh, And it's important for us to acknowledge that God does heal all of our diseases, but he doesn't necessarily do it right now at our beck and call. This is important. When we pray for God's healing, which is good to do, we must realize that God has shown himself to go about this healing in basically three different ways. 
And you can jot these down if you'd like to. Uh, Number one, immediate healing. This is the kind that we all want. God's immediate healing. That is, he intervenes immediately. And while perhaps this is not normative, uh, frankly, God can do whatever he wants to do. He can do this. And I love hearing reports of doctors that they're confused by a drastic turnaround in diagnosis. Heard some of those reports in our very church. You know, God does heal. Sometimes he does it immediately, and it's a surprise. I'll give you an example from the scriptures of this happening. Many, actually, of Jesus' miracles during his earthly ministry involved this kind of healing. Mark 2 is one of them, the healing of the paralytic man. It says this, starting in verse 9 of that chapter. Jesus says, Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. So Jesus, obviously, he has the power to heal immediately. But here's the second way that God sometimes goes about healing. Sometimes he goes about it eventually. Not immediate healing, but eventual healing. Now this would include potential medical intervention. You know, God uses doctors. I don't know why some Christians can't really seem to understand that. But yeah, God uses doctors. After all, Luke, one of the gospel writers, was a doctor. And then there's this passage in in James, right at the last chapter there, It's talking about someone who's sick, and it says they are to call on the elders and anoint them with oil. The idea is is to to bring refreshing medicinal oil to the person. I'll read it for you. James 5, 14 through 15, it says, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. So we see both a physical and a spiritual healing mentioned in that passage. So God sometimes goes about healing immediately, sometimes eventually with use of medicine. And the last one, we can't forget this, is that God will ultimately heal in heaven. And this is not the answer that we want to some of life's problems, right? That you have to wait until the afterlife. But this is the truth, that God sometimes waits to give ultimate healing, but he will indeed do so, you know, for reasons sometimes only he knows. He'll allow our physical bodies to undergo sicknesses, which are are common in this broken world. And uh, there's some interesting passages where you can see that God does allow some people to remain sick. 2 Timothy 4, verse 20, Paul writes this at the end of his last letter. He says, Erastus remained at Corinth, but Trophimus I left sick at Miletus. Tiniest little detail. In, in the end of this letter, Paul shout out, saw these people he knows. But, but I found that very profound. Here's Paul. We've seen him in the book of Acts, days of the early church, performing healings through, through the power of the Spirit on people. And yet, here, he's leaving someone sick. Now that leaves room for the possibility of God's will in the matter. Who knows what was taking place here, but we do know that Paul, an apostle, left somebody sick. And then Paul himself, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, let me read this. He's he's talking about himself. He says, To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So we see that Paul himself struggled with something that's thorn in the flesh. Uh, We're not given more detail, so perhaps it's not a physical ailment, but most likely it is. He prayed for it to leave, 
And God said, no, I'm going to leave this with you to keep you humble. Nevertheless, when it comes to healing, ultimately, we have to remember, we believers are headed for a kingdom, whereas it says in Revelation 21, verse 4, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Think about that. No sickness in heaven. Is anybody looking forward to that? <laughs> Maybe you've experienced God's immediate healing in your life or, or eventual healing. Maybe you're waiting for that ultimate healing. But keep the faith. It will come. You know, those times when we plead for God to bring healing to us or, or our loved ones, we are asking him essentially to bring a piece of his future kingdom into the present, which I think is totally appropriate to do. But we also need to trust God's will and timing and always leave it in his capable hands. You know, even though God is not bound to heal every disease, every healing does ultimately come from him. And certainly spiritual healing of the soul only comes from him. So God indeed is, is Yahweh Rapha, God our healer. He heals all our sicknesses. Let's look at the next awesome thing about our God. He delivers us from death. He delivers us from death. Verse 4, who redeems your life from the pit? In this verse, the idea of pit, it could be translated grave, or it could be pit as in a place where a dangerous animal like a lion is kept. Uh, the Bible uses that, that word in, in various different ways. And uh, Jesus, when he rose from the grave... He gave us an example of his power, of what it means to defeat death, to be delivered from death. He rose from the grave, and we, who believe, will also physically resurrect unto life. We will follow our Savior's example. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 and following. He says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And so death is not the end of our story, those of us who believe. Another benefit of the Lord is that he enriches our life. He not only delivers us from death, but while we're here, he enriches our life. Verse 4, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion. Think about that phrase. That God crowns us. <laughs> that the king of the universe would give crowns to his subjects. Is that not mind-blowing? I think that's totally backwards. But that's how good our God is. That he crowns us. And one day, we're going to cast our crowns at his feet. Following the example of those we see in Revelation chapter 4. Listen to this. It says, When the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. So God enriches our life with so many things and when we are in his presence one day we are going to bless him we're going to cast our crowns at his feet next thing about the lord he also gives us satisfaction he gives us satisfaction verse five who satisfies your years with good things he gives us satisfaction this is that of which Mick Jagger could get no Huh? This is what Bono from U2 was searching for, but still couldn't find. The truth is, no man is ever filled to satisfaction but a believer. And I love how some of the, uh, the great Christian minds of the past have talked about this, that only satisfaction comes in God. Blaise Pascal, he's that influential mathematician and philosopher, he said this, he said, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. I love that. And then Augustine of Hippo, 4th century theologian, in his famous work, The Confessions, he said this, he said, Great are you, O Lord, 
and exceedingly worthy of praise. Your power is immense and your wisdom beyond reckoning. And so we men who are a due part of your creation long to praise you. We also carry our mortality about with us, carry the evidence of our sin and with it the proof that you thwart the proud. You arouse us so that praising you may bring us joy because you have made us and drawn us to yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. And to that I say, amen. Now, next point about our God that the psalmist brings up. He, he gives a metaphor here in the end of verse 5. It says, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. And so our God also renews us. He renews us. I think it's very interesting how in Psalm 102, we have the psalmist, he's moping with the lone desert owl. Do you remember that from last week? He's like, I'm like a pelican out in the wilderness. I'm like a desert owl. And here in Psalm 103, he's soaring high like the eagle. One commentator explained when it's talking about being renewed like the eagle, he says, the expression, your youth is renewed like an eagle's, may allude to the phenomenon of molting, whereby the eagle grows new feathers. I'm not sure about that, but uh, ultimately, we know that eagles are they're inspiring creatures. We know that they're strong, and so it's a picture of spiritual strength and vigor in God who lifts us up. Isaiah also used the same imagery. Isaiah 40, starting in verse 29, says, He, that is Yahweh, gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. God has so many mercies for us. Just, just look at this list. This is just a, a snippet of what God has done for us. Isn't that amazing? He forgives our sin, all of our sin. He heals all our sickness. He delivers us from death. He enriches our life. He gives us satisfaction. And he renews us. This is a God that's worthy of worship. God has all of these mercies for us. And many more, they flow from who he is. So we've talked about what he's done Now, why has he done all these things? Because he's a good God. These are the things that he's done because he is who he is. So let's look now at verse 6 and following. It says, The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as a father has compassion on his children, So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. How beautiful is that? I feel my soul filled just reading that. Uh, but, But here we have a blessing of the Lord for who he is. This is where David goes next in this psalm. Before he goes any further, we see that David first makes reference here to God's interactions with Moses. Did you notice that? God's interactions with Moses up on Mount Sinai, this was when Israel first became a nation. And really what David is doing is he's quoting the words of Moses in Exodus chapter 34. It's a passage in which God describes himself. This is God's description of himself. And and I want to read part of this for you. In in Exodus 34, I'm going to read verse 4 through 7 of that chapter. And what I'm about to read all takes place after the people's brazen idolatry of the golden calf. Keep that in mind. You know the story. They lose sight of the God that rescued them from Egypt. Moses is up on the mountain, and they go back to their old ways. Debauchery, idolatry, they make a golden calf and worship it like the people of Egypt would have done. Moses 
went back up the mountain, and we read this, Exodus 34, 4 through 7. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. Remember what happened to the old ones? Moses had a hissy fit, and he threw them on the ground. Bold move. I, I think Moses has some uh, anger management problems. Uh, you can gather that from the rest of Exodus. Uh, but he goes back up, and God is so good that he gives him two new stone tablets that have the commandments written upon them. Verse 5 says this, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, this is God speaking, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Now, here, getting back to Psalms, we're seeing God does what he does because he is who he is. It's his character, his nature, and these listed here are his attributes. And these are reasons to bless and thank him. So I wanted to so slowly go through this list. This is who God is. Moses, it was revealed to him, and then David proclaims it here in Psalm 103, that God, Yahweh, is just. Yahweh is just. He sees all of the injustice in the world, and he will repay. Romans 12, verse 19 says this, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So God is a, a just God. A, a lot of the biblical authors had questions for God. You know, why aren't you doing something about evil in the world? Whether it was Babylon or the Philistines. And, and God always reminds them, I am just. I will take care of it. And we need to be reminded of, of that as well. What we see in the world taking place, injustice. But God will get the last word in his timing. So God is a just God. Now this next one. This is how I would uh, kind of summarize the attributes mentioned here, that he is a relational God. He's relational. Notice in, in Psalm 103 there, verse 7, he made known his ways to Moses. What do we learn by that phrase, that God makes known his ways? What we learn here is that God wants to communicate with mankind. God wants to communicate with us. He's a relational God. And uh, incidentally, Dr. Freiberg's class, I was eavesdropping this morning just on the other side of the wall. He was talking about that today. And this is the class, How We Got Our Bible. You ever think about what the Bible is? It's God's communication to us, which implies that God wants to communicate to us. He's not a distant God who, who doesn't care about what happens here. No, that's the God of deism. That's a false God. We believe and the God of the Bible, who wants to communicate with us. And he reveals himself in many ways. He reveals himself in creation and in our consciences. We refer to that as general revelation. But he also re reveals himself in, in special ways. He reveals himself through his son, Jesus Christ, who came to the world, who took on flesh. Uh, God also reveals himself through his word, the Bible, and through his spirit, our comforter. And here, it's talking about God revealing himself and his law to the Israelites on Sinai. Whose idea was that? It was God's idea. God is a God who is relational, who wants to communicate. And I think that is a reason to praise and thank him. Now, this next one is compassionate, that God is compassionate. Verse 8, the Lord is compassionate. Your translation might say merciful. This is a fascinating word if you study this one in the original, it comes from a Hebrew root meaning womb. You heard me right. Womb, W-O-M-B. Now you think, okay, what's the connection here? This word has connotations of parental loving concern for a child, knowing their limitations. 
And we got a little bit of that in verse 13. We'll talk about that shortly here, that God is a father who has compassion on his children. But here, this first use of the word in verse 8, kind of a maternal idea, right? People might be confused about that these days, but only women have wombs, okay? Uh, Let's just take it back to Anatomy 101. So why is this being used of God? We know that God does not have gender. He's a spirit, and we worship him in spirit and truth. That's what it says in John 4. God is referred to as the Father exclusively in the Bible. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, and we cry out, Abba, Father, right? That is how he has revealed himself, and it has to do with his authority. But God also, in different places in the Bible, compares himself to a mother by analogy. Now, don't get scared. I'm not getting woke here, guys, all right? <laughs> don't worry about that. But I wanted to show you this because I thought this was fascinating, that God takes the best elements of his creation and uses them as a metaphor for himself. He takes the best aspects of a father, the best aspects of a mother, and applies them to himself. Listen to these two passages from Isaiah. The first, Isaiah 49, verse 15 and 16. He's speaking of his love for the people of Israel. He says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even those may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of of my hands and then the last chapter of Isaiah Isaiah 66 verse 13 the Lord says this as one whom his mother comforts so I will comfort you and you will be comforted in Jerusalem so all of this just to say God is a a loving parent to us and that is a reason for praise okay the next one is gracious the very next word in that verse verse 8 the Lord is compassionate And gracious, this means he gives to others what they do not deserve. He gives to us what we do not deserve. I I like this illustration of of California Highway Patrol. Picture you, you get caught speeding. You're on the 125, you're going 125, and, and they catch you over by Grossmont College over there. Now that you get pulled over, justice would be what? Justice would be receiving a speeding ticket from the CHP for speeding. That's justice. Mercy would be not receiving a speeding ticket from the CHP, but a little slap on the wrist, a warning. Don't do that again, you bad boy. Okay? What would grace be in this analogy? Grace would be the CHP officer paying your speeding ticket for you. Okay? Okay? Giving to you what you don't deserve, that is, paying for your fine. And God is gracious to us. He gives us what we do not deserve. Some have said grace makes a great acrostic. God's riches at Christ's expense. That God just opens up his treasure house of blessings and pours them on us, even though we don't deserve any of it. The next attribute of God that causes us to praise him is the second part of verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. Our God is a God who is slow to anger. We know from the book of James that we also are to imitate him in this, to be slow to anger. This is a funny idiom, like an expression in the original Hebrew. It is, it's quite literally, God is long of nose. He's long of nose. And that's, that's kind of a weird idiom. You know, it doesn't quite translate into English. But the idea is he's long-suffering. In other words, he puts up with a lot. God is slow to anger. He puts up with a lot. His righteous wrath is surely there, but it kindles slowly, you could say. He doesn't speedily execute the sentence of his law. Rather, he defers punishment as long as possible. He's slow to anger. I love Second Peter Chapter 3, verse 9, which says this, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's our God. He's, he's slow to anger. And actually, that's part of the peace when you look at his justice. You know, why, why, why does it seem like God isn't doing anything about the injustice in the world? Well, his justice is also tempered by his mercy. He will settle the score 
on everything, but he's giving time for people to repent. Now this next attribute here, the very last part of verse 8, he's abounding in loving kindness. This is a special word, chesed, which is translated in many different ways, faithful love, constant love. The idea is that it, it, it never runs out. We constantly sin, but God doesn't constantly accuse us. The phrase here in verse 9, the next verse, says, he will not always strive with us. That word strive is literally to, to bring a court case against. So our God drops the charges on us. Why? Because another took the penalty for us. Jesus Christ took our penalty, and so justice was served. God is both just and the justifier. I love how Charles Spurgeon, reflecting on this verse, put it. He said, O gracious God, thou art too just to take revenge twice for the same faults. And therefore, having turned thy fierce wrath upon him, that is Jesus, thou wilt not turn it upon us too. Jesus paid it all for us. Amen? And so these are all reasons to bless the Lord for what he's done. But it's also appropriate for us to bless the Lord for what he has not done as well. We see in verse 10, it says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. When I'm justified through faith in Christ, it is just as if I'd never sinned. It's an easy way to help remember that. Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. And this next part is all about that, about a merciful God who justifies us. Uh, Look at verse 11. Look at these analogies in this section. The first one is, is of the sky. God's mercy is as limitless as the sky. It says, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. You look up and it just goes on and on. A few years back, Karen and I went to Montana. And you see on the license plate there, it says, big sky country. And I was like, they're right. <laughs> the sky just seems a little bigger up here. And it's a wonderful imagery of just the the expanse of God's love. It's actually employed a few other times in the book of Psalms. But my favorite analogy is in verse 12, to look at that again. It says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. This idea that God has completely removed the heavy load of sin from us. As far as the east is from the west, that is to say, an infinite distance. It's a beautiful phrase, but I want you to think about your life as we read this. All of those things in your life that you're ashamed of, sinful thoughts, maybe turned into sinful words or or sinful action, things that you wish you could forget. Well, guess what? God can forget it, and he can remove it an infinite distance. And uh, here's the analogy. I just stole this from the library a few moments ago. If you travel north or south, right, if the psalmist had said, you know, as far as the north is from the south, if you go north, eventually on the other side, you're going south, right? It meets up. (laughs) So that's not the analogy here. Notice that the beauty of this is that if you travel east, you're always going east, right? And if you start going west, you're always going west. So if you, if you travel north or south, you're eventually going to arrive at the pole and you can't proceed in the same direction. But if you travel east or west, you never reach a pole. You can go east or west forever and ever. And it's a beautiful analogy because the sin that was carried away by Jesus, our, our scapegoat, when he died on the cross, it's never coming back. Amen? Isn't that beautiful? As Romans 8 verse 1 puts it, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then the next analogy is the analogy, once more, of a compassionate parent, God our Father. It says, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. God loves his kids. And unconditional love is something only a parent can really understand. God knows our humble origins. He can sympathize with our weaknesses. And he even took on flesh 
in Jesus Christ. The second person of the Trinity took on flesh and walked in our mortal shoes. So God is compassionate. He knows our frame. He knows we're weak. Now let's press on into the psalm. Verse 15. David writes, As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of, of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it's no more. And its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. So once more, we have a contrast between fragile, frail, temporary man and an everlasting God. And our lives are so temporary in comparison to God. It's a really strong contrast. And I couldn't help but think as I was reading this about those those dust devils we get out here in Lakeside sometimes. You know those really hot summer days and the, the dirt, it starts to lift up and it's like a little mini twister. They happen all the time over here on the, the lot next to the church. And really that's a good metaphor for what our lives are like. Bits of dirt, quite literally, that are animated for a short period of time before returning back to our place in the ground. We're like dust devils. <laughs> But God is not like us. He's eternal. He always has been. He is now, and he always will be. He is the great I am. And his loving kindness, notice, is eternal with him because he himself never changes. His loving kindness is firm and strong forever. So God extends his mercy into our frailty and in saving us makes us everlasting too. He he gives us everlasting life so we could live eternally with him so now as we kind of get towards the last part of this psalm we, we talked about the reasons why we should bless the lord because of what he's done and who he is now i want us to consider how we can bless the lord we're going to go from the why to now the how of blessing the lord now notice in the passage who the recipients of this loyal love are in verse 17 says on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. So here's our next point. How do we bless the Lord? We bless the Lord by obeying him. This is not just lip service. It's real service. Obedience is worship. Like the words of that old song, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Jesus put it this way in Luke 6, 46. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? No, we are to worship God through our, our actions, obedience. So as you think through your life, is there an area of your life that you need to, today, surrender to the Lord in obedience? And, and what a blessing that will be to the God who saved you. Do it for him. Do it for him. Let's look at verse 19 now. It says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. So here we have the last part of the psalm. It's highlighting the fact that Yahweh is the reigning king of the universe. He reigns from heaven as king over all, and he reigns not only over us, human beings, but over every single created thing in time and space, which would include angels, which are mentioned here at the end of the psalm. God's ministering spirits, as Hebrews 1.14 puts it, ministering spirits send out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. These angels are arranged into ranks and hosts, that is armies, there's angel armies, angelic armies, and God rules over them all, commander in chief. He is Yahweh Sabaoth, that's one of his names, it means he's the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies. And we're to join in their praise, they're praising him, we're to join in with them. David ends this psalm just as he began it, by exhorting himself to bless the Lord. He says, bless the Lord, 
O my soul. And so this is our final point from Psalm 103. We bless the Lord by obeying him, and we bless the Lord by praising him. Robert B. Chisholm, Old Testament scholar from Dallas Theological Seminary, I like how he summarized this. He says, The book's theological message may be summarized as follows. As the creator of all things, God exercises sovereign authority over the natural order, the nations and Israel, his unique people. In his role as universal king, God assures order and justice in the world and among his people, often by exhibiting his power as an invincible warrior. The proper response to this sovereign king is trust and praise. So that's it. We've examined God, some, some of the things that he's done. We've seen that he does them because he is who he is. Now what's our response? We obey the sovereign king and we also turn our praise to him because he's worthy of, us, worthy of it all. And so today we're just going to conclude with three songs. You thought you had us pinned, right? You know, a little Baptist liturgy going on here. Two songs to close and we're out. No, today we're going to do three songs. All right, because it's not about you. It's about God. All right, so let's uh, bring the team back up and we're going to continue to worship our God now in song and bless the Lord by praising him. Let me pray to conclude today's time in the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for who you are. You're too good, God. You're too good to us. We don't deserve it, but we gladly receive it, Lord. We receive your loving kindness, and we turn your blessings back to you to praise. Father, thank you for being in our midst. Thank you for being a God who saves. Lord, if there's anybody in here today who's not yet bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, I want to give them opportunity to cry out to you from the depths of their heart and say, Heavenly Father, I know who you are. I acknowledge that you are king of the universe and that I've grieved you with my sin. But today I claim the promises of Psalm 103 that you forgive all of my sin and you remove it from me. And I believe you did that through Jesus Christ, your son whom you sent, the perfect lamb of God who took on flesh, lived a perfect life that we could not live and died on the cross in place of sinners. He's my substitute. And I also believe that he conquered death on the third day. And so I worship him now as my personal Savior and Lord. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.